Oh, that's me. That's that. <laughs>
Amen. Thank you so much. You can be seated this morning as we pray together. God, we just thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross. And as our class talked about this morning in Sunday school, God, there is nothing that we can ever do on this earth to earn your love. You already loved us so much that you not just spilled one drop of blood, God, you laid it all down to show just how much you truly love us in spite of who we are. And as we reflect on that this morning, God, we come to you this morning to worship, to praise, and glorify your name. Be with us as we continue to worship you. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Hope everybody's doing well. Hope y'all have had a good week. But if you hadn't, today is the first day of the week, right? And we can turn that right around today. Yesterday was a good day at the church. And you say, well, what in the world went on yesterday? Well, Brother Roddy had, uh, he called it a meet and greet. But everybody that he's kind of partnered with, there's a sports program now with H2H and uh, Miss D. What's the name of her? I don't know the name of her program, but she works with ladies. And uh, she works through a food bank to give away food. And there's a, a, a football fan club that donates. So all these people got together and they had a basketball tournament and they had a fundraiser. And they was probably 30, 40 kids and a bunch of adults all gathered in the gym and they got to share the gospel with them and they got to be on the property. So it was a good day yesterday at the church, whether y'all knew it or not. So we're happy to have um, some more visitors with us this morning and... Uh, we don't yet have our children's church ready yet, but uh, we're we going to get there. So if y'all make some racket, don't worry. It's, it'll be okay. Uh, we're just glad everybody's here, and we just want to worship our Lord. He truly has done so much. And if we think about, if we just get to thinking on that for just a minute, how awesome he's been to us and what he's done for us, we won't have a hard time getting away from the, the cares of the world and getting into the love of Jesus this morning. So let, let's do our best to do that. And just give him all the glory and praise that he deserves. You know, one day soon, we're going to see Jesus face to face, those who are saved this morning. And the song we're going to sing first is, Therefore the Redeemed. It says, Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return, and come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. And one day, I look forward to that day, we're going to sing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Oh 
know God loves you so much. What more can I say? God just loves you so very much that he sent his son Jesus. Living, he loved you. Dying, he loved you. Buried, he loved you. But most importantly, he rose again because he loves you. Sing with us this morning.
this morning, God, and thank you so much for all you've done for us. As we transition into this second part of the service, God, I just pray that our hearts and our minds are focused on you so that we may learn more about you and focus on the word that's presented, that it may challenge us to draw closer to you and to serve you better. Be with us. Thank you for all you do. In your name we pray. 
Amen. Well, I know all of us might not be loud ameners or talkers or wavers or whatever, but the word amen simply means that I agree. So before I start preaching this morning, and no, if you don't say amen, don't mean I'm not going to preach. But before we get any further, I believe we ought to just try it one time and agree that God has been so good to all of us. So on, yeah, there you go. See, I didn't even have to count her down. Y'all just did it just right. If you will, turn to the book of Hosea, and that's in the Old Testament. And don't feel bad for looking at the table of contents and finding the page number. Um, I use a slightly more scientific method. I just flip through till I see it. Um, and you say, we're the pastor. Well, it's, it's, we all got our struggles. How about that? Some of the minor prophet books I get mixed up. With the praise and, and the worship going this morning and everything that's happened this morning, everything's just kind of lined up. God has been so good to us. He's given us so much. And in retrospect, he's asked so little because anything we can give don't amount to a whole lot. But the way we save, the way we serve him, or the way we praise him, or you could even say the way we worship him, says everything about how we appreciate what he's done for us. Now here in the book of Hosea, he was writing to the northern ten tribes, so, which is called the nation of Israel after the, after the twelve tribes split. They had left Jerusalem, they, they had taken uh, Jeroboam II, was the king at this time, and they had set up their capital in Samaria. And they had built two golden calves, one at Bethel and one at Dan, so that the people wouldn't return to Jerusalem to worship. And they built these golden calves, and okay, that, that brought up a red flag right there, right? Thou shalt have no graven image before me. But they built something to worship to kind of fit their surroundings, to fit what they thought they needed. That's problem number one. Then, at that time, the Assyrian Empire was the big empire, they paid homage to Assyria. They, they, they trusted their, their safety. And, you know, they really, we see, we hear on TV and hear the stories about mobsters going in somewhere and be like, hey, it's a dangerous world around here, but, uh, you know, you pay me such a much, so much every week, it won't be dangerous for you. And that's really what happened here with nations at that time with Assyria. They said, well, look, man, we're fierce and we're bad and we kill everybody that defies us. But if you pay homage to us, right, if you give us the due honor that we reserve, we, we won't come at you like that. Make sense? And what happened, they had turned from a God-fearing nation and not just a God-fearing nation, they were God's people into a split worship. They started worshiping idols that the Assyrians brought in, that the surrounding neighbors brought in. The worship that, that was going up, to, that they thought was going up to God was at these calves. And what was happening, it was, it was halfway doing something for God. And that's why I put halfway service. Halfway acting like what they were supposed to act like. And if there's a problem, and this is not just an American problem, if there's a problem that is absolutely killing Christianity in this world today, is a halfway Christianity. Because if the world doesn't see a difference between you and them, why do they need what you got? If you have the same problems that they have with no answer, why do they need what you have? Right? If you have no more peace, no more joy in your life, What's the difference? And these are all consequences of getting half of God. And let me just put it this way. Jesus plus anything equals nothing. Because Jesus will not be God with another God in your life. He can't be. Because if Jesus is God, no other can be God. And you say, well, I don't do this in my life. Well, we all do. So let's just go on. Get over that right from the get-go. 
And we're going to talk about three major ways that we see. And really in Hosea 14, he's got to the end of the book. And you ought to read Hosea. And you read through the first two chapters and your eyebrows are going to be raised. And you're going to say, what in the world did that say? And then call, talk to me about it. And I'll talk you through it. You'll probably get it. But he's gotten here to what they need to do. What they need to do to get back to God. And in the prayer that he tells the, the Israelites that they need to pray is really where we're going to see three different ways that they were halfway serving God. And I believe we fit that way. And each one of us in our lives, we get caught up in work, in family, and in pleasure. Anything that falls in those three categories. And we end up allowing our work, our family, or our pleasure to be an idol between us and God. And it is just as true today as it was then. Jesus will not be the second God in the household. There's no such thing. Jesus is not a God among many. He is God alone. And if he is to be worshipped or have fellowship with, he will be the only God. And a lot of times we lose power in our lives. We lose God's miracles in our life, if you, if you will. Because his presence and the things he does so many times, that's exactly how it works out. Because we're not truly worshiping him. Halfway is no way at all. Just coming to church on Sunday morning ain't worshiping God. That's not, that, that, that's, that's recognize him as a God, right? Or giving him a time. But a true God who's done so much for you is a God that needs to be praised all week long. See, Kyle, that's how that all's fitting in. Boy, you like it. No, I like it. I don't know about you, but I really, really like it. Because God just done so much for us that he deserves an all-the-way kind of worship. Amen. So let's read what Hosea said here in, in chapter 14, verse 1. O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. I want to read you a couple verses, and I put them up here. You don't have to turn back. But in the 8th chapter of Hosea, he kind of told them exactly what they had done. Exactly how they had disobeyed God. And I thought I'd put them up there. There it is now. There you go. In Israel 8.3, this explains exactly what, what I told you. But I wanted to tell you before this where you'd understand. Israel hath cut off the thing that is good. The enemy shall pursue him. The thing that is good is God. They have set up kings, but not by me. They have made princes, and I knew it not. Of their silver and gold, they have made them idols, that they may be cut off. And, and Jesus is just being honest right here. And you say, well, well, so he's just getting so mad, he's just like a little kid. If he don't get his way, he's just taking his ball and going home. And people would have you to have that opinion of him, but what you don't understand is he's not taking his ball and going anywhere. What he's saying is my people have been cut off because they decided to be cut off. I didn't go nowhere. They did. They were right where I wanted them, and they said, I want to wander over here. Right? So let's, let's, let's not put the wrong persona on God. He is a God of love. Oh, he's a God of mercy. And he's a God of grace. But God is where God's at. And if we would get to him, we're going to get to him. He's not, he's not bending and changing who he is to come to us. We'll either be where he is in the Lord Jesus or we'll not be with God. That's what he's saying. He goes on to say here in verse 5, Thy calf, O Samaria, hath cut thee off. He said, as soon as you built something to worship that wasn't me, <laughs> you ain't got no part of me. Mine anger is kindled against thee. How long will it be ere they attain to innocency? Really, God's saying, how, how long is it going to take y'all to realize what you've done? And look at me and act like you've done nothing before me. For from Israel it was also the workmen made it. Therefore it is not God, but the calf of Samaria shall be broken into pieces. The thing for the Christian, and just listen to this right here, you will be broken. 
When you've given your life and you belong to Jesus Christ, you do not belong to yourself. You are a runaway slave. And your master seeks you. Your master has bought you. And I know those words have negative connotation because of our history. But please step out from that for just a minute and, and realize that to truly give yourself to Christ is to become his bond slave. Is to give everything you have to him because everything he has is so much better than anything you could ever do. And when you leave that, all your provision, all your joy, and all your happiness is right there. But we have such a good Jesus. He's not going to get us to put us back into slavery. He's going to free us from the slavery that we're putting ourselves in, running back to sin. That's what's really going on here. And he says, boys, I'm going to break you out of this, whether you like it or not. How many of y'all heard your daddy say something like that? Boy, I'm going I'm to get you out of that whether you like it or not. Daddy used to get that. He'd get that I, can't, I can't do the perfect thing. But he'd get them teeth and he'd get real mad and say, boy, you're going to do it whether you like it or not. And that finger get to point. And you know it's about to go down. And really, God in his anger, he says, you have, you have dishonored me, you've disrespected me, and you've disappointed me. And I'm going to get you out of this junk one way or another. You ain't serving no other gods. And this is why we know they didn't repent. And this is why Assyria was able to take them into captivity. Because they would not be broken of the sin. So God did what he had to do to break them away from it. Sad thing about these northern tribes is they never came back. Samaria today, the Samaritans we read about in the New Testament, this is who they are. They, they, they mixed God and other things. So the Jews hated the Samaritans. You know why? Because they, they were a half-worshipping people. They, they had God and some other stuff. They worshipped in a different place than God had set up. And I want to say this the right way, because it's going to sound ugly, but I don't mean to be ugly. But a real Christian has something against a halfway Christian. Because a halfway Christian makes Jesus look like less than what he is. And when we worship halfway, we give him half the honor that he deserves. You get what I'm saying? And we are headed for judgment as God's children. When I was growing up, daddy would put up with a lot. He'd whoop us later. But if we did something to mama, and that was always the thing, is you ain't going to disrespect your mama. You ain't going to make your mama look bad. And, uh, of course, mama didn't need much defending. As sweet as she is, she gives some of the worst whoopings. Because when the real nice people break, they break bad. <laughs> and uh, you asked, y'all talked to my brother Paul one time, asked him about the curtain rods. <laughs> just kept, uh, she just break all, and Paul got it. What do, boy? Anywho. What we want to see this morning is let's be careful how we worship. Remember, worship is simply how we view and what place in life we put God. This morning, there was some worshiping going on in this joint, right? Because we were singing songs about the greatness and the awesomeness of Jesus and what he's done and how awesome he's been to us after he's even done that. And we put him right on up there where he belonged. That's why I believe he was up in the midst of it. And I like it. Oh, I like it. But when we put him down here, when we put him down here, what are we doing to him? And not just what are we doing to him, what are we doing to ourselves? We're cutting ourselves off from the Almighty. So as we, as we look at this, we're going to go through this prayer. And let's see what, what he told them how to repent of. And, and let's look and try to see where we can apply this. And apply these principles to our life so that we can fix, if there be any, half worship. Go on to the next one. Listen to what he says in verse 2. Take with your words and turn to the Lord, saying to you, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously. So will we render the calves of our lips. Now, really, when he says the caps of our lips, what he's saying is the praise of our lips or the price of our lips. So take you with words. 
this tongue, if you read in the book of James, remember a couple years ago we studied the book of James, this, this tongue right here is compared to a rudder. It turns a big old ship, right? This tongue can destroy you. It brings life. It brings death. And some of us kiss our mama with the same tongue that we act a fool with. That's another thing I heard. You, you kiss your mama with that mouth. Words can be deceptive. You can make it sound like what you want. You can make yourself sound like anybody you want to. And you see a lot of this, that high school mentality. You got to puff, you, you got to paint yourself right where people see you like they need to see you, right? And then about 12th grade or the first year in college, you realize, well, shoot, it don't really matter anyway. Them jokers ain't even around no more. You can just be who you are. And then you make fun. Fit friends with more people than you wouldn't have made friends with before because you're just painting a false persona of yourself. Because they was just as messed up as you was. We do this with words and we do this with God. We paint a picture of who we are and what we want people to see and what we want God to see. And we work with our lips but not our hearts. See, they, they had said plenty of stuff to God. They still called themselves Jews. They still read through Chronicles. They still cried out to God when they got in trouble. But it wasn't the hearts that they wanted to worship God. It was the lips that they wanted to paint the picture of who they wanted to be. And God still give them what they wanted from God. Y'all kind of see where this fits today, don't it? You ever catch yourself in this spot? When you wanted to beat your kids before you got to church or... Or, or you've been arguing with your wife because she was wrong about something. I've got, I can't see her eyes. All I can see her eyes. I can now. She peeked up. She knows I'm lying now. I'm sorry, Lord. <laughs> but it, it, even as little as we can come in the house of God. You know, sometimes if you had a rough week, it's okay. Somebody says, how's your week go? Man, it was horrible. <laughs> you got to come in spewing all over people. But how you doing, But I ain't doing good. Boy, I need him today. You know, that's just truth. When we, when we worship him, he doesn't want just words and tradition and, and, and just a song to come out of our mouth. He wants a song to come out of our heart. Because a man who ain't got no education can sing more beautifully to Jesus Christ from a changed life than a man with a PhD in literature. Because what he's given is his heart. And Jesus, he even told us in Luke and in Matthew that really no matter what picture you paint, it's going to come out who you really are, right? He's going to be, Jesus sees who you are anyway. But everybody else will too. You can play the Christian thing for a long time. You sure can. And you'd be pretty successful at it. Wait till something wrong comes in your life. Tragedy strikes. Wait till your true colors come out and the embarrassment that's coming. And I hope that don't, that don't uh, categorize nobody this morning, but just puffing up our lips to Jesus is not praise. It's not worship, and it's not service. Saying, I believe, don't mean a lick unless it's in your heart, right? If it's saying that people are going to miss heaven by 18 inches, they say it and they think it right up here, but your heart's about 18 inches from your head. And it, he could come out here all he wants. All you want to throw that Jesus word out there. But until Jesus is right here, it don't make a lick of difference. If that's true, how we worship him, we need to get right before we worship. We probably need to have two altar calls, just to be real with you. We probably need to get right, and then we worship him. I think that's why I like that communion so much. We had communion in a time with the Lord, and then we praised him. And boy, I like that too. I'm not going to lie. I hope y'all liked it too, because it's going to happen again. That was good. This ain't what Jesus wants. He didn't save your lips. That's why some of us still say stupid stuff. Right? He saved your heart, which controls your lips. Let's go to the next one there, Miss Brittany. And I did. I got the Wi-Fi fixed this week. Boy, I am boom, I'm all over the Wi-Fi. I ain't come disconnected yet, but uh, something ain't jiving. 
So I got that old pretty lady back here, and that's my wife, in case some of you I don't know. <laughs> Flipping the slides for me. This is what he says in verse 3. Asher shall not save us. And Asher was the first capital of Assyria. So he's talking about Assyria. Will not save us. We will not ride upon horses, neither will we say any more to the work of our hands, you are our gods, for in thee the fatherless find mercy. The first half of this applies here. Let me just say this. When I say soul, a man is made up of three parts, and this is biblical. A body, what you can see, a spirit, the animated part of Jody that you hear, my personality, my voice. And in the soul, which is where the breath of God relies, which is the part that never dies, which is the part that Jesus deals with. And he changes the rest by getting a hold to that. Does that make sense? So when I say with our minds and not our soul, I mean with our physical and not our spiritual. You could put it that way. When we physically... Say something to God, we're using our lips. But the soul is what gets fed through our heart. Does that make sense? So what we're getting at and what they're saying here, what they needed to repent of, is they had these schemes and they had these plans. And they had this whole system set up where they could have God and, just fill in the blank. But they had to repent that they were trusting on anything but Jesus. They thought horses and an alliance with a powerful nation was the answer to get what they wanted. And that may work for a while. There's going to come a day when the Antichrist is going to build up an army that would scare all nations that have ever been. And he's going to have a really good shot at beating a human army. But then King Jesus is going to step foot down. And can I tell you what? Can't nobody beat King Jesus. He ain't even going to fight. He's just going to say die. And that's it. He ain't going to break a sweat. So if a human schemes can't come nothing compared to what God does, why do we try so hard to figure everything out? He said, because I, 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 need, I need to use what he's given me and I need to figure out how to use it. And, 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 and do this, this, and this for him. That's wrong. Can God speak to you? This is the answer. Yes. I, I hadn't got my audible voice yet. And I'm going to keep telling you, I'm waiting. And if I die, and y'all find me, and it looked like I was praying, he finally spoke aloud, and I just had a stroke. But I'm still waiting for it. I really want him to speak to me like that. But just like this, this whole word right here, his spirit will get to speaking in you. He'll get to knocking on that door and pulling them strings that you didn't think could be pulled like that. And you'll just know that he's talking to you. We worship him how we think we ought to do. And boy, I've been so guilty of this, and y'all have too. We do things because, man, we got this and we ought to do this. We got this and we ought to do this. And we could do this and we could do this and we do this. And then we get so disappointed because it don't work. We get so disappointed we don't get the result we need. But it's because we were worshiping and serving him with ourself as the idol. With our guilty conscience or our ideas as the standard and not the voice of God. And I don't, I don't too much like that being true, to be honest with you. Because that makes me guilty. Just as guilty as sin, right? Because I, I, I think and I figure and I scheme and don't know I'm scheming. And I'm taking away the ability of God to tell me exactly what he wants. And can I apologize to y'all this morning? I've done that these past three years I've been the pastor. And I haven't meant to. I think it's part of learning to be a pastor. And we're going we gonna to mess up on some other things too. And I know he does. And he ain't judged me. He's told me a couple times, and it took me a couple times to get it. But when we'll stop and we'll wait for Jesus to tell us what to do, we won't have to apologize for trusting in the wrong things. 
because we'll be trusting in him. That's tough because it takes time and it takes patience. There's two things this human condition make us really weak at. Waiting, waiting, and waiting. And I guess that's just one thing three times. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thought I had another one in there. It just went blank. But we worship him with our minds, getting it figured out, but we're not with this. But when he gets to stir it up and when he gets to control it, then that one person you talk to, it, they end up getting saved. Or you see a change in their life. Or that person to come to church. You didn't guilt them to come to church. They come and they worship God for the first time in who knows how long. And we've all been there. We've all been in that situation of what what we wanted to do and what we needed to do. And and I'm I'm telling you right now, I'm having a hard time with a couple things about how we reach people in the COVID era. We wouldn't just blowing doors down, reaching out everybody in the neighborhoods with our schemes before. And I'm struggling because I'm waiting for God to tell me exactly what we need to do to make an impact right here with lost people that ain't that may be going to church, but they they just going. So I'm just being honest with you. I don't know where you, where y'all at, but there's something. Miss Brittany, go to the next one there. The last part of the verse. It kind of builds on itself, and I, I like how the Bible does that. It makes it easy for simple-minded folk like myself. To to catch on. We speak it, right? We speak the wrong things. That turns into thinking the wrong things. That turns into doing the wrong things. And and it's not even doing the wrong things, but it's working with our hands and not his strength. Peter tells us that, that now as Christians, we're living stones. And we're being built upon each other as the temple of God. But the the mortar that goes between those stones that brings people together who have different likes, different interests, different cultures, different backgrounds, different futures, is not people. Because we've proven, and that's showing real big in America right now, that if it's left up to us, we don't don't get along. Anybody who's different than us, we're not going to like. That's how people work. So let's just be honest about that. But when Jesus gets involved and he starts bringing in people, He's the mortar that binds us together. And if we're going to build that church that is his church, that he is the foundation of, our skills and our hands ain't going to do it. See, they had thought what they were going to do. It ended up they built idols. And it wasn't just the calves. It was the idols. Do you know that if I thought I was doing something for God, let's say I built the church for him. And that's not what God wanted me to do. But I did it because that's what I wanted to do. That I'd have built an idol for myself. Because it was something for me to make me feel good that I accomplished something. He said, I don't know about that. Well, think about it now. That's as basic as it gets. And that would be an awesome, spectacular thing to build a church for people to come worship and be saved. I don't mean God couldn't use it. But I've put something between me and God. And he knows. We got to be careful. About our plans getting down to our hands. And our hands get to building with our minds. And not his strength. Because his strength does. I like this, uh, this show. We was watching it with the kids yesterday. But it's uh, Homestead Rescue. Y'all ever seen? That's pretty cool. These people live out in the middle of nowhere. Something's happened to their places. This guy's a homestead expert. He brings his son as a daughter. In the seven days, man, they they hooked him up with a survivable homestead in the middle of nowhere. They can live off grid. And I seen it yesterday, and and they man they was building a cabin like up a three hundred foot cliff. And how are they notching these logs and doing all this, putting it all together. But how many times you can even just see, and that log could have squished them. Matter of fact, they like to tip the truck over in the river, getting it across. And a man could have got caught in there and drowned. 
And if he takes all the credit for that, then woe unto him. Because how many times did God keep something from happening to him? How many times did God's hand come in and give him the strength when he was wore out to not get hurt? Or give him the brain to know how to do that kind of stuff? And that man can do some amazing stuff. But when it comes to worshiping God, see, when you lay everything at the feet of Jesus, it, it doesn't take your individuality out of the way. But when I, when I say put your hands down at Jesus, it, as you lay down before him and don't get scared by this word, and he anoints you to do his work. And that, that does, that's not a mystical word that he gives you the spirit, no. If you're born again, you have him living within you. He's there. But he anoints or put his, puts his blessing or puts his purpose or his power, his strength, his can do in what he's given you to do. When you can build or you can sing or you can play or you can be a prayer warrior and you put that, you turn that over to Jesus at his feet and says, use it how you want. You'll find yourself being used mightily of God and saying, man, I didn't know that could happen. Because you went all the way in serving him with his strength because you can. These things may seem simple. There's, of course, there's some severe cases of that, but I don't, I don't think that applies here with, with these three things with, with this church. Because I think we all have the right methods or the right attitudes that we want to please God and we want to serve him. But are we serving him right? And are we doing what we do for him? And Miss Brittany, let's look at this last slide. The most wonderful thing, and I've said it a million times, and I'm going to say it to me. One of the greatest phrases in the Bible is, but God. I like that. That beautiful little conjunction turns a bad situation into a moment. See, he said, you need to repent of all these wicked things. And listen to God's reply in verse 4. I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from him. I will be as the dew unto Israel. And think of that. The dew is what dries the eyes up from the ground and waters the grass and waters the plants. Even before the fall, it never rained. Did you know the dew is it, what watered all the plants and all the beautiful garden? The dew. He's saying he, he will be your provision for Israel. He shall grow as a lily because Jesus' provision is great. It's better than anything miracle Grow can put out. It's the good stuff. And cast forth his roots as Lebanon. And Lebanon had, were known for their big, mighty trees. And you can't have a big, mighty tree without long, strong roots. His branches shall spread. His beauty shall be as the olive tree and his smell as Lebanon. They that dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall revive as the corn and grow as the vine. The scent thereof shall be as the wine of Lebanon. He's, there's a promise, is what he's saying. That if y'all will turn away from this wickedness. And Kyle, you can come on. And turn away from your halfway looking at me. Remember who I've been to you. And that's who I'll be again. And I just put them here. You'll be forgiven. Do you know you can't run so far from Jesus that he can't reach out to you? You know there's not a sentence so great that Jesus won't forgive? If you kill somebody in your own death row, you're probably still going to face the, the death penalty. You know why? Because you're going to reap what you sowed. But it don't mean Jesus won't save you eternally. The worst criminal is the one you couldn't forgive. My Jesus can forgive. He sure can and he will. These people spit in his face and worshiped other gods. And he was willing to say, I forgive you if you turn back to me. How about that? We'll find provision for all these things we need. You say, well, I need the right words. Well, he's got them. Need the right thoughts. He's got them. Need the right way to use my gifts. He'll show you. You shall be beautiful. I, I really don't have ever hopes of being, you know, a model or nothing. Maybe in the big and tall catalog. 
But what he's talking about beautiful beauty here is in looks. But you ever seen the way a grandparent looks at a grandchild? I seen it this morning. Scott over there done ruined that little boy. He don't even know it yet. Or maybe the little boy done ruined Scott. I don't know. But you can see it in Keith and his grandbaby. I see it with my daddy. See it with Joel and their grandkids. All of you, I see them grandkids. Even John and Sue, I see it with how y'all treat them kids. And it's that look of just love. And just, man, them kids couldn't do nothing wrong. It don't mean you wouldn't whoop them or discipline them. But that, it don't matter what they did. they just be so pretty to you because they're yours. And see, that's what he's talking about to make you beautiful. God will look down and he'll see his creation and see that it's good instead of wicked and running from it. When we turn back and we get close to it. And it, this, this just sums it all up. We shall live in the shadow of the Almighty. You ever watch on TV how, how a, a chicken will gather around their little hens when they're in trouble and protect them? God ain't no chicken. I'm not saying that. But it's the same picture. When, when you run up close to Jesus, John said he was the one who laid on Jesus' breast. He got up there close for some good fellowship. And what he's saying here is when you'll turn back to him, and this might take every minute, every hour, it might take every day. How many every times, every day to get through this? But he'll put you right back out there in the shadow. That You got to be close to somebody to be in their shadow. That's under their protection, their provision, under their watchful eye. The righteous are always in the eyes of the Lord, the Bible tells us. That is, if he'll be our focus, if he'll be our guide, if he'll be our service. And I, I don't know where everybody stands this morning, and, I, and I'm not exactly 100% sure, and I, I never really am, why God gives me a message the way he does. But some of us needed to hear it this morning. And some of us need to get away from some of our devices and some of our ways that we may not be living in sin of what we think, but we're just as... We're just as disgusting to God in some of the things that we're producing. And that don't sound good, but I say it that way where you'll know just how bad it is. So this morning, whether you need to pray in your pew, whether you need to come to the altar and pray, would you lay down whatever's between you and God and get back under the shadow of the Almighty this morning and worship Him with all that you have? Would you do that as we stand? And I've got so much to thank Him for, so much to praise Him for, and you see, He's been so good to me. And when I think of what He's done, and where He has brought so much to thank Him for. This morning, if there's somebody watching or somebody that here that, that doesn't know Jesus, that, that doesn't know that they've never completely served Him because they've never completely given themselves to Him. And if that's the case, this morning, Jesus' hands are open. You're not thinking that. You're not feeling that. By, by chance, it's him calling you. And just as he told these Israelites, if you will simply be honest with him about where you're at, that you're a sinner and you don't deserve God, you don't know him, but you believe he died for you and that he rose for you, and that you just want him to save you and you want to give him your life. And if you'll do that this morning, he'll save you. <laughs> and you'll be his to worship. If that's you this morning, would you come to the altar and just ask somebody to pray with you? I'd love to pray with you. If you're online, Miss Brittany's going to put a number and an email up and you get a hold of us, we would love to help you. For everybody else here this morning, we're going to sing that one more time and we're going to sing it. If you don't know all the words, that's fine. Just sing what you do know. Cause boy, that's good. So let's sing that, Brother Kyle. Got so much 
to thank Him for so much, to praise Him for, and you see, He's been so good to me, and when I think of what He's done and where He's brought me from, I've got so being so good to us and Jesus leaving your home in heaven and dying for us was too much but yet you keep pouring out your love and you keep pouring out your blessings and you are truly worth more than we could ever give you but this morning Lord we know we can give you our praise We know you, we can give you our hearts and give you our lives. And I pray that that's the case of everyone in this place, Lord. Pray that that's the case that everybody's watching, Lord, that they have it, that they would. So that you would get the honor and you would get the service that you deserve for all that you've done. Jesus, I pray that we'll leave this place just in awe of you just in love with you more than we've ever been, with the desire to, to do more for you than we've ever done, but Lord, but the, for the patience to wait for you to tell us what to do. Jesus, we love you. And we ask for your blessing on these, Lord, as we go out of this place. So in Jesus' name we do ask. Amen. You can be seated for just one moment. Just a couple announcements I do want to give you. One, we do have, um, most of you know, uh, Brother David Bennett, his wife passed away, and last weekend was the funeral, and we sent flowers. Uh, typically, we usually just send to our members, but the Bennett family is family. So some of you that may not have been for, for a long, long time, but they, they've been, the Bennett family is just family. Let's just put it that way. Uh, you need more explanation than that, I'll let you know. So we sent flowers. And uh, so Brother David sent back a card and said to Gwinnett Hall Baptist Church, uh, family, thank you very much for kindness and sympathy during this time. And Jody, thank you for the kindness of words, of God's words very much. Appreciation with love, David Bennett and family. So I wanted to make sure I read that. And he was very appreciative of, of those that got the call or, or, or the flowers that got sent. Um, we do have the, the, some, I guess, updates on the missions conference. Sorry, my brain's a little foggy right now. It's going to be the second week in November, the 8th through the 11th, right, Brittany? The 8th through the 11th, Monday through Wednesday. Sunday, not Monday, Sunday through Wednesday, I'm sorry. Sunday, we're going to be here. We're going to have some missionaries come in. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we're going to have a virtual service. If you would like to come, I would love for you to come. The doors will be open. We're here. We'll be singing here. But instead of having missionaries come, um, so far, Brother Chris Woodley is going to send us a video about what they went through this year and um, of what's going on. The Sparks down in Chile, they got stuck here trying to come back and get some medicines. We support them there in Chile. They're going to give us an update. And then Brother Stanley Ewing um, from, the, from Bandung is going to give us an update. And they're, they're all going to preach. Well, thank you. They're all going to preach and kind of give an update. But it's going to be on a video form. So, be a little different. Um, but to be honest with you, that during the mid-Sunday night and during the week, there hasn't been a lot of people coming. So, um, I, I don't want to bring, bring other people in for, you know, to come in by themselves. So, um, I, I know once things get a little better, that, that'll all get back to normal. So, that's what we're going to plan to do. We are going to take up the G dollars that we've been collecting. We haven't mentioned it. We haven't had bulletins. So, if you haven't been collecting them, there's no guilt. There's no... It's fine, but we are going to take those up that week before, and uh, we're, we're going to give. Th this year, we have less than our missions fund, so it, it'll be a little less what we do for them, um, but I already know some needs that we're going to provide and that we're going to send, I, I know, for the Woodleys in their school, so, um, but just to let you know that, 
the, the other details, we'll, we'll, they'll come as we give them. I mean, come as we give them. That sounds bad. They'll come as we get them. Um, and uh, we'll get the full schedule printed out for you maybe by next Sunday and uh, have all that worked out. So I love you guys. I had a great morning this morning. God was with us. I'm so glad you were here. If you're online, I'm so glad you were where you were at listening. Love to have you in the church, but no matter what, you worship with us, however you will worship with us. And uh, we'll be back tonight at 6 p.m. We're going to talk tonight about Jesus is coming soon. So you want a blessing? Come on back and let's get in, get in the word about Jesus coming soon. So let's stand and we'll be dismissed. Brother Levi, will you dismiss us, please?